to Building the Cycling City. My name is Gordon Pedelford. I'm the Executive Director of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. We have an exciting evening for you here tonight. Uh, but first, a little bit of housekeeping. Bathrooms are back. If you go through the doors back there, and they have signs for this level, and then you can also go down to the basement. There are more bathrooms down there. There's food and drink, and please help yourself at any point. We don't have an intermission, so just get up when you need to get up and take care of business. And so next, I just want to say thank you. This evening would not have been possible without all of the phenomenal sponsors and partners. We have community partners who have been helping us get the word out, food and drink sponsors from Convoy Coffee, Peddler Brewing, and Eleven Winery. And we have the Vancouver level sponsors coming in at Cascade Bicycle Club, Climate Solutions, Lid I-5, uh, Makers Architecture and Urban Design, MIG SVR, Transportation Choices Coalition, and Washington Bike Law. So thank you. And then the Copenhagen level sponsors, we have Alta Planning and Design, Bike Works, uh, Lime Bike, Natural Investments, we have a booth over there as well, Gino Family Cyclery, Amsterdam level sponsors, the Bolin Fund, um, Kylie and Mark Ostrow, and last but not least, the Impact Hub, where we are hosted here tonight. So please give a warm thank you to all of our sponsors that made this night possible. And now, here to say a few words about the space we're in is Christian. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Christian Bork. Um, I help run uh, Impact Hub with our team. And I really have two reasons to be on the stage today. One is I'm super proud of the Greenways team. They've been part of Impact Hub ever, ever since the beginning, I think, Gordon, isn't it? Uh, so way longer than I've been here. Um, you're now at Impact Hub, which is one of 100 globally. Um, and there, it's one big network. Some say the biggest network of social entrepreneurs in the world, with roughly 16,000 members across five continents. Believe it or not, this is the biggest one with about 40,000 square feet and dozens and dozens of organizations like Greenways. So if you're ever in a need for inspiration in the social innovation space, come and visit us. We have events. There's um, shared space services like co-working and event spaces and generally just a lot of awesome people. And the second thing I'm, I'm super proud of today is I'm Dutch. And I, <laughs> and I, I just moved here two years ago. And, um, and sometimes it takes, you know, somebody from another country to tell you that something that you think is totally normal is actually very special. Um, and I've, I've learned a thing or two from, from these guys, um, so I'm really looking forward. Um, and uh, welcome again. Oh, one more housekeeping thing. Um, feel free to use our Wi-Fi. If you choose and pick up Seattle as a Wi-Fi, you get a portal, but you can sign up as a guest. Uh, and you're free, feel free to use it uh, whenever you want. So welcome again and enjoy. All right, well, thank you. So I'd like to do a quick poll. Um, put your hand in the air if you know that Seattle Neighborhood Greenways got our start in 2011 by focusing on bringing neighborhood greenways, traffic calm, non-arterial streets to Seattle. So it's a long question, but bringing neighborhood greenways to Seattle. All right, so a lot of you know how we got started. And then put your hand up if you know that we've really expanded beyond that original mission to focus on being the leading organization, making our streets great places to walk and bike and live in Seattle. So, all right. So for those who haven't heard about us, our expanded mission, I um, just want to give you a little bit about us before we launch into the rest of the evening. So we have three main ideas that really underpin what we do as an organization. And the first one is that everyone of all ages, all abilities, all walks of life, deserves a great place to walk, bike, and live. And number two is that change is possible, and that we can change the systems and the city we're in. These are human-created systems, and we can change them to reflect our values and our needs. And, yeah, feels, feels poignant at this moment in history, for sure. Um, and then three, our volunteers, empowered through a, grass work, a grassroots neighborhood-based chapter 
uh, system really are the people that are going to be making that change. And that third point has really always set us apart from similar organizations across the country. You know, our neighborhood chapters set the direction of our organization. They keep us rooted in the community. And they organize all around the city to win changes at the neighborhood level, like sidewalks, bike lanes, and trails. And so just a little bit about where we've come from. You know, in 2014, we won adoption of the Bicycle Master Plan. And there's still a lot to be done there, but it's a pretty great plan. In 2015, we helped pass Move Seattle, which funds almost all of the walking and biking and transit investments in the city. 2016, we led a successful campaign to reduce speed limits on 2,500 miles of Seattle streets. So that was exciting. Um, in 2017, we helped the Duwamish Valley Safe Streets get funding to design a trail connecting Georgetown and South Park, two communities that have been divided for way too long. Yeah, give it up for Jesse and the vet. And then in 2018, you know, we really organized around saving the basic bike network. And we did a people protected bike lane in the street and we really lifted up voices. You can see some of them around the room um, from everyday folks like you. Many of you probably joined us in that to say that we really need to create a center city, the heart of our city, as a safe place to bike for everyone. And so looking forward, um, we want to make every part of this city a great place to walk. And we want to build a bike network that connects every neighborhood. And last but not least, we want to create safe routes to schools and transit so you can get to where you need to go with your friends, your family, your loved ones, safely, comfortably, conveniently. And we're doing a lot of work out in the community. Claire is going to say a little bit about it uh, when she's up here. But this is just what's happening in the next month. A dozen different meetings, different organizing campaigns across the city. Maple Leaf Greenways is meeting tomorrow. Central Seattle Greenways is meeting on Monday to talk about how to build protected bike lanes on Pike Pine. Uh, Green Lake Wallingford Safe Streets is meeting next Wednesday to talk about fixing the Green Lake area, making it safe for people to walk and bike with their families. And that is just next week. And there's a couple of that I didn't mention. So there is so much going on. There's so much energy in the city. And I just want to thank you for being here tonight. And I want to invite you to be a part of this story, because it is a story we're crafting together. And next, I want to introduce uh, Mark Ostrow, who's on our board and a leader with Queen Anne Greenways, who's helping us bring the story from Amsterdam here tonight. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, so, true story, this, the planning for this event started six months ago uh, with a tweet. Um, Chris tweeted from his easy chair, I think uh, there was a picture maybe of his socks, he had some fluffy socks, and uh, a cup of cocoa, and they were just finishing up the book, and they said they were going to go out on a tour, and I said, are you coming to Seattle? And they said, definitely, but nothing's planned yet. And I said, let's plan it. And now it's happening in real life, and I could not be more thrilled. So uh, a lesson to the kids in the audience, uh, eat your vegetables, um, stay in school, and tweet every single day. And it's going to get you far. It'll get things done. Um, really, I, I just want to single out uh, Susan Gleason, though. Uh, the person probably, there were a lot of people involved in putting this together, but the person uh, with the, the greatest role in turning my tweet into reality uh, is Susan. So if you see her, there she is. If you see her, give her a special thank you. So uh, Chris and Melissa have a lot of friends here in the audience, but uh, if you don't know them already, uh, they are the co-founders of Modacity, a marketing and communications firm. Uh, they are leading thinkers, uh, keen observers, brilliant storytellers, and beautiful photographers. Um, so please join me in welcoming Chris and Melissa Bruntlett. Quick question for AV, does that mic over there work? Can I use that? 
Okay. To keep you awake, you gotta look both ways. <laughs> All right. All right, we're gonna get started with a little warm-up exercise, a little pub quiz, um, just to get everyone warmed up and stood up and uh, interacting with us. So um, if everyone could please get on the two feet. Um, this is, a, this is a, a game that we put together with our friends at Mobicon. They're an engineering firm based in Delft in the Netherlands, but they also have an office in Ottawa, and they helped us put these questions together and, uh, and uh, donate some prizes that we're going to give away to the lucky winners. Um, this is all on the honor system, so um, <laughs> please don't cheat. Um, we're going to run through a series of questions. Uh, they're multiple choice, so if you think uh, we'll call out A, B, C, D, put up your hand if you think that's the answer. And if you get the question wrong, please be seated and uh, you're eliminated. And uh, <laughs> the last two people standing will, uh, will walk away with a little prize. Any questions? It's pretty straightforward. All right, question number one. How many bicycles does the average Dutch person own? If you think it is A, 0.4, raise your hand. All right, we got one? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll let you go again. <laughs> you I might, gave you might be the only one that got it. <laughs> we might have our winner right here. Uh, B, 0.9, raise your hand. Okay, we've got a few. If you think it is C, 1.3. All right, we got the majority, and D, 1.8. There we go. All right, and the answer is... is it? <laughs> it is C. <laughs> so, yes, there are nearly 22.7 million bicycles for the 17, 17 million inhabitants of the Netherlands. So everyone that got it right, please stay standing, and we will carry on. All right, question number two. And this is a visual clue. Uh, of the four people you see on your screen, which one is not, repeat, not a former or past member of the royal family in the Netherlands? If you think it's A, please put up your hand. Okay. There's a few people. All right. B, hands up. Okay. C. Okay, it's pretty evenly split. Mm -hmm. D. All right. Drum roll. The answer is A. <laughs> and then there were 10, 8. Hands up if you're still in it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Do I have anyone in the back? Like nine. Okay. Oh, ten. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, question number three. How many kilometers did the Dutch collectively cycle in 2016? Oh. If you think it is A, 387,500 times around the earth, please raise your hand. Okay. If you think it is B, 40,200 times to the moon and back, all right, C, 35 times to Mars and back. Okay, or D, 0 0.016 light years. Okay, and the answer is, you're all right. <laughs> that a was a trick question. <laughs> all right, so everyone who's standing, please remain standing. You guys are actually doing really well, comparative to some other cities we've been to, so good job. <laughs> This All is right. usually where we get you. This is where we separate the wheat <laughs> from the chaff. <laughs> How many lanes is the widest motorway in the Netherlands? If you think it's A, seven lanes, put your hand up. B, 10 lanes. C, 13 lanes. Yeah. D, 19 lanes. Anybody? One gentleman at the back. Okay. All right. Well, we have one winner. <laughs> uh, yeah, the answer is 19. That includes counterflow lanes and on and off ramps. Uh, for a Do you want to show way. the picture? Yes. This is what so it there looks you go. Like. 
in all of its glory. <laughs> all right, so the gentleman in the back has won, but everyone else who was still standing for that last, we'll go to the next question and we'll find our winner and everyone else that was left. So stand back up. The people that, were, that got that last question wrong, but we're still in it. All right, okay. Question five. What is the lowest point in the Netherlands? Part of the metric. Yeah, we, we could change it, but whatever. <laughs> uh, 1.62 meters below sea level. A, any takers? B, 6.76 meters below sea level. Three, four, four five. five. Okay, C, 8.24 meters below sea level. Two or 14.97 meters below sea level. All right, and the answer is 6.76. All right, how are we? We got one, two, three, four, five people still in it. Okay, this is, this is the, uh, oh, nope, that was the next one I'm thinking of. You got it? Yeah, okay. Percentage of all trips in the Netherlands made by bicycle. Think if you think it's it? A, 27%, put your hands up. These two gentlemen. B, 32%. C, 39. There's two. And D, 47%. All right. Again, the answer that is was a, a tough one. It's only 27, only 27%. <laughs> <laughs> One, right. in four, one in four trips cross country made by bicycle. So these two guys are well, in we, the shoot off. In the shoot off, yeah. Yes. So it's, this is a numeric answer and the closest two <laughs> will win. So think about it for a second. How many bicycles are stolen in the Netherlands each day? Get this is a, in a country of 22 million bicycles? 22.7. <laughs> As the slide earlier said. <laughs> All right, you guys have a number? Is it like the closest without going over? No, just no. the closest in general. <laughs> 100? 100? All right, and yourself? Uh, 2.7. <laughs> <laughs> so 10%. Um, no, I guess uh, Mark is closest, right? Yeah, it's, so 880 it's 880 per day. <laughs> And only about 25 to 35% are actually reported, so. So congratulations, yeah. Mark. You've won another copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the gentleman in the back, where did you go? That, oh, he's, so. We have a, yeah, no, he's right there. You got it? All right. So thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, we had to switch those questions around. Uh, we originally had that 27% one at the beginning and we lost everybody the first time we, <laughs> we played. So, so good job, everyone. Thank you. And thank you to MobyCon for sponsoring. And all right. So um, yeah, big thank you to, to everyone that brought us here, to Mark and, and Susan and the entire team. Um, it's, I mean, Seattle's not that far away from us and kind of feels a little bit akin to Vancouver, so it's nice to come here and be able to share our story and some of the lessons we learned. Um, but first, I guess it, it seems prudent to explain to you why you've got two Canadians standing in front of you telling you about the Dutch cycling story. So, a bit of backstory for those that aren't familiar. Um, in 2010, Chris and I sold our family car, not because we were trying to be altruistic, but because we wanted to save some money living in a really expensive city. Um, we lived both pretty close to where we were working, so we started to adopt cycling as our, our main mode of transportation, mixing with uh, walking and public transit, living in a, quite a walkable community at the time, and still do. Um, about two years in, I kind of got tired of answering the same questions as to how I managed with two children to navigate my city um, without having a car and, and what that looked like and was I crazy. And so I started writing a blog and shared a lot of my experiences, what it was like to travel with the kids. Um, I talked about everything from the walking that we did, a lot about biking, how we mixed car share and public transportation into that. Um, and essentially, tried to dispel a lot of the myths that people thought about what a family without a car would look like in the city of Vancouver. 
So while Melissa was off on her own kind of journey into bike advocacy, um, I, was, I was working at an archi architect's office at the time doing the same bike ride along uh, one of the neighborhood greenways in Vancouver and found myself kind of sticking out like a sore thumb. I was the only one cycling in regular attire on an old Dutch bike um, with no helmet, no special safety gear, no brightly colored clothing and uh, didn't see myself represented in the imagery that the uh, cycling advocates were using in the Im imagery that the media was using um, and, and certainly felt like um, I was an anomaly. And so um, partnered up with a few friends and we started the Vancouver Cycle Chic blog um, just to kind of show people imagery that was more relatable, more accessible. Um, th people riding a bike um, in photographs, we did a series of short videos with the whole idea of just presenting them with an image that they would see and think, hey, I can, I could do that. So skip ahead to 2016 and Chris and I realized we were essentially doing the same thing but separately and decided to um, not just be life partners but also business partners because, you know, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully nothing so far. <laughs> Um, and so we started Modacity and the whole idea was to build on that idea of sharing the stories of the people that we knew, the cities we visited, our own hometown, um, and really try to communicate the positive uh, benefits of building cities that are, are places for people. And in talking about cycling, we figured we couldn't really tell the true cycling story without visiting Amsterdam or the Netherlands in general ourselves, and so we spent five glorious weeks traveling around to five different cities with our children, fully immersing ourselves in Dutch cycling culture uh, to really find out what made it so special. Um, and um, is it, I can't remember now, it's been a while since we've done this presentation. Yeah, okay, so, we've <laughs> so we wrote a book about it, um, obviously. <laughs> Um, and, you know, tonight we're going to talk a lot about the, the things that we learned, the things that we, a little bit about what we share in the book, but before we get there, uh, I just want you to uh, close your eyes for a second and think about your trip to work, to school, to shopping, uh, however you, pl you usually get there. Think about the sights and the sounds. Get that picture in your head. And then experience what it's like for the Dutch. So one little quick anecdote we always like to share is we did not pay the gentleman behind us whistling. He just happened to be there to further emphasize the point. <laughs> so needless to say, it was love at first sight. Uh, we came back um, reinvigorated to keep um, advocating for the, the, uh, the ideas and the, and the safe streets that we were previously pushing for. But um, we found that uh, there was only so much of the story we could tell digitally through blog posts and, and articles that we were writing and eventually, you know, pitched the idea to uh, write a full book about it. Um, and one of the reasons why I think we, we really strive to sell the Netherlands as a model is because it's not just a, cycling, a series of cycling cities, it's an entire cycling nation. Um, everybody talks about how Copenhagen has more bicycles than cars, but there are actually 202 different cities and towns in the Netherlands where bicycles outnumber cars. You can see them on the screen there. So they've done it in a variety of contexts, not just their big cities, but their medium-sized cities, their small cities, um, in rural locations, in urban locations, um, in, in cities that were originally car-centric, in cities that uh, went car-free very early. Um, and they've, they've accomplished what no other nation has uh, from, from coast to coast, essentially. But um, when we were trying to communicate these successes, we always heard the same old excuses, whether it was in the comments section and people we were chatting to, oh, the Dutch are different. The Dutch are, their cities are somehow built differently than ours, or um, the, our city, that would never work in our city. And uh, um, we, we kind of compiled those, those myths and those excuses and, um, and immediately you know, set about trying to dispel a lot of them. The first one you'll always hear is it, it's a flat country. It's flat as a pancake, and that's the one and only reason that the, the Dutch cycled uh, so much. And uh, we always uh, point out that it's, it's not that simple. It couldn't possibly be that simple, because if that were true, then you know, certain cities in the, uh, in the Midwest, whether it's Winnipeg or Chicago 
or, or Kansas would be, you know, the cycling capitals of North America were that, were that true. The, it's obviously got a lot to do with the way we design our cities and our priorities of street space. The other myth that we always hear is, you know, they don't get the same winter that we get here in North America. And I know that here in the Pacific Northwest, we're a bit of an anomaly, but it doesn't matter, even in the rain. Uh, the Dutch cycle, no matter what weather throws at them, and, you know, when we, when we talk to a few Dutch people and we say, oh, they say you guys don't get winter here and that's why you don't ride, and they, they'll say, well, you just should try being here for one of the North, wind, North Sea winds and, and well, maybe we can have a better discussion about it. Um, yeah, the Dutch really cycle all year because they've been given a safe space to do just that. It doesn't matter what weather throws at them, they will cycle all year round, uh, no, matter, no matter what. <laughs> and then the third thing we always heard was uh, Dutch society is somehow um, more altruistic. They're more um, compassionate, more caring, more egalitarian than those of us in North America. And it was around that time that uh, Hurt Wilders um, the gentleman you see on your screen was rising to prominence and while he didn't ultimately win a majority in, in, in the national elections there, um, and for those of you who don't know, he's kind of the Donald Trump of the Netherlands, um, but uh, you know, it, it, I think his, his, uh, his popularity just proved to us that uh, they are just as reactive as we are, their society's just as flawed as ours. Um, again, they just design their cities a little bit differently. They're no more morally superior or care, care about the environment or any of these, these uh, considerations than, than we do here in North America. The reality is that the Dutch cycle, because they've been given a nationwide network of fully, separa sep fully separated cycling infrastructure, um, of their 140 thousand kilometer road network, again, apologies for metric, you're going to get that a few times, uh, 35,000 kilometers of that is completely separated. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty telling that it can connect you from the no very north of the country down to the southern tip, um, and you can travel pretty comfortably wherever you go, and it's, you know, they've created um, space for people where they don't have to worry about the stresses every day that most of us deal with in, in navigating with car traffic. <laughs> so um, it's not just about physical separation of modes, it's also about taming the automobile and the Dutch have done that um, better than anybody in their cities. Uh, the, the stat that we dug up was that 75% of their urban streets are traffic calmed to a speed of 30 kilometers an hour or less, which is about 20 miles per hour. Um, so it creates these conditions where walking and cycling isn't just more convenient, it's more comfortable, it's, it's obviously safer. Um, and uh, virtually every street that you, you go on is, is kind of a de facto bike route and not just the ones that are painted green on, a, on Google Maps. And the other reality is that uh, the Dutch are properly investing in cycling. Um, often throughout North America we hear talks of trying to reach certain uh, percentages of cycling mode share, but oftentimes our, our investment doesn't match what we're trying to reach. In the Netherlands, they currently spend about 50 euros, or sorry, 30 euros per person per day, or per year, sorry, <laughs> on cycling, um, which in, in, for us in Canada, that works out to about $50 Canadian, or I guess would be maybe about $40 per person here in the US. And you know that number kind of varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but right now in, in Canada, we're looking at about $5 per person. So that's sort of, that's one-tenth of what they're spending uh, throughout the Netherlands on cycling and you know every once in a while they get to use that money to create something pretty spectacular like the Hoven Ring. So to better understand how um, unremarkable cycling has become in the Netherlands we like to point out this fact that the Dutch have two separate words for cyclist. Um, the first on the left there is uh, wheelrenner which literally translates to wheeled runner. So this is the hunched and helmeted um, sports cyclist that uh, dominates the, the streets and the, uh, our culture here in North America. They're riding for sport, they're riding for to get somewhere as fast as possible. They're often dressed for the occasion um, with the uh, special equipment and the brightly colored clothing. But tellingly, they, they're only a, a tiny, tiny minority of the cyclists that you see on the streets in the Netherlands. 99.9% um, .9 of the people you see riding there are the everyday fietsers, which is, just translates to person on a bike. Um, and they are just rolling around on uh, a beat up old uh, black bike more often than not, uh, wearing their regular street clothes, 
often uh, without a helmet, and uh, they're using, rather than running with wheels, they are using cycling as a, a more of a walking with wheels, uh, more efficient, slightly faster way of, of strolling around their city. But, um, you know, we, when we talk about the Netherlands, a lot of people think, well, it, they've always been that way. Um, it's just always been a cycling utopia. And one of the things we found in our research is that is very much not the case. Uh, they had their own um, ventures into motorization, same as we did here post-war. Uh, the difference is that through various uh, means, they course corrected, and one of those was through a lot of citizen activism. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, as neighborhoods were being raised and streets were getting widened, uh, pe the people in the Netherlands started to realize that this is not what they wanted for their city. They would much prefer the uh, more calm, bike-friendly, or people-oriented spaces, and so in the 60s and 70s began to uh, push back and played a big role in changing how cities uh, how their cities didn't fall to the same uh, fate that many of ours did. So through mass rides, not too dissimilar from critical mass that a lot of us have probably experienced here, um, to show that that space needed to be for cyclists, uh, to having mass die-ins, like the picture in the top right there, where uh, citizens would just show up to a park, lay down with their bike to represent the number of people that were starting to get killed in uh, motor vehicle collisions throughout their cities, and then even possibly even more important to note is the Stop to Kindermord movement, which was a nationwide movement, uh, basically representing the number of children that were dying in the streets and mass protests throughout the country, to really tell their their government that this was not what they wanted. They wanted places that were safe for their children, safe for everyone to use, and really helped to forge the way. Stop to Kindermord meaning. Oh, yes, sorry. Stop to Kinder Mort translates to stop child murder. There you go. <laughs> Those direct Dutch, they don't beat around the bush. <laughs> um, so if you go to Amsterdam today, um, there's always this kind of feeling, this assumption that they were always going to be a cycling city, that, um, that their status as a cycling city was a given. And when we started digging into the stories and the history there, um, did we really start to appreciate that how hard the citizens had to fight for it and how razor thin the margins were um, Joden Breestrat, which is kind of the, the story that we tell in the book, um, and you can see it up in the top left of your screen there. It's the old Jewish quarter in the city center of Amsterdam. And uh, in, after the Second World War, the, uh, the German-inspired engineers and American-inspired engineers wanted to raise it to the ground to build a, an at-grade motorway. And uh, it was only in reaction to the citizen protests that the city council voted to cancel that project, and it, then it was only a single vote um, that decided that uh, that project. So, you know, had that vote gone slightly differently, the Amsterdam that we'd visit today would look and feel a lot different, and, and its bikeability would be heavily compromised. We don't want to stand up here and talk to you about how wonderful the Netherlands is, even though it was pretty awesome when we were there. Um, we want everyone to sort of leave here understanding that there are tangible applications here in North America and that this, a lot of this stuff is happening here, so to not be dismayed. And when we look at citizen activism, uh, we went to Boston and spoke to Jonathan Fertig, who was, um, he doesn't live there anymore, but at the time was very active in the advocacy community there. Uh, due to a very tragic event uh, that happened where a woman was right hooked by a truck and unfortunately passed away, uh, he um, and fellow activists pushed back at the local government saying we need separated facilities on here, this has always been a notorious tr uh, stretch of the road and the city didn't act fast enough so he went out with some traffic cones and some flowers one night and created a bike lane to show the city that space was there, space could be allocated, and it was time to prioritize, and through that effort, actually managed to start seeing change in the city. Uh, they might still have a really long way to go. We, were, we had the pleasure of visiting there uh, earlier this month, but they're doing a lot through uh, just regular grassroots, regular people living in the city, to really change the mindsets of not only the politicians, but also the people driving to see that the space can be shared and why it's important to do so. But it's not enough to, sometimes it's not enough to, um, to organize yourselves and try to convince your politicians to do the right thing. Sometimes you just have to run for office yourself. And that was kind of our big takeaway when we started digging into the story of Groningen, which is a, a smaller city of about 200,000 in the north of the Netherlands. And there, 
Um, in, the, in the 1970s, a 24-year-old Max Vandenberg, uh, who had recently graduated from the university, uh, there he is in the top right corner looking very dapper, um, decided to run for city council in, in opposition of plans to, to widen streets and start demolishing the city center and creating space for cars. And um, he actually won on that platform and uh, moved very quickly to um, make the city center a, a more friendly place for, for walking and cycling. And so he implemented a traffic circulation plan that uh, cut the city center into four quarters and basically made it impossible to drive directly from one quarter to the next. And they, people would have to circumnavigate around the city making walking and cycling the most convenient and direct mode um, almost instantly. And so one morning, um, Groningen residents woke up and uh, found these hostesses parked at convenient spots around the city center with barriers and uh, baskets of flowers and informational pamphlets. And uh, the city center was never the same place after that. And despite the protestations of the shopkeepers, you know, despite uh, they were painting slogans on the wall, they were protesting at City Hall. They, there were death threats that were uttered towards Max. Um, he went through with this plan and uh, groaning in now that we uh, see and experience is uh, all the better for it. Yeah, the, the city that we got to experience when we were there was, was pretty spectacular. Um, the city center itself was very, very walkable, very bikeable to the point where there's there's a lot of bikes in Koningen. Um and we didn't we weren't even there during university uh, school time. Apparently, the the number of people, bikes on the street triples once students are in session. Um, but it you know the city that we got to experience was pretty awesome in terms of being able to cycle comfortably with our children, never having to worry about. Uh, whether they were going to have to deal with uh, cycling next to cars that were taking over space from them or were, would be more aggressive. And, you know, while those numbers are, you know, quite impressive in terms of the mode share, it is considered one of the smallest cycling city, like top cycling cities in the world. They're now having to face some new challenges, which I'm sure lots of us would hope to have, where, you know, you have bikes teaming out front of shops, not really leaving much space for, for foot traffic, and a lot of their bike routes are actually experiencing bicycle congestion um, during peak university time. Um, but they are trying to find some unique ways of, of addressing that. So they're, they might not be, they might not seem like problems to us, but they're certainly problems to them, but they're being very at, um, active at the city council level in terms of addressing them. So political bravery is gonna be something that you hear from us uh, repeatedly over this, uh, this presentation. And for, uh, in a North American context, we didn't have to go far to kind of find uh, a great example of that. And that's in our backyard right in Vancouver, British Columbia. And around the time that we moved there in, in 2008, a, a uh, fresh-faced young mayor, Gregor Robertson, was elected on a pro-bike platform and instantly began to build uh, fully separated bike lanes into the, in, in the city center um, and then pushing them out to the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, the, the pushback was monumental. The business community, the media, certain neighborhood groups lost their collective minds. There were, um, you know, the media predicted it would be the beginning and end of Gregor Robertson's career. Um, the DVBIA, which is the Business Improvement Association, said it was going to choke the lifeblood out of the downtown. Um, but in, in the face of all that opposition and that kind of uh, raised rhetoric, um, they pushed through the controversy. Um, and we're now at a point, you know, 10 years later where we've got a pretty robust network, minimum grid of separated cycle tracks and uh, the DVBIA, which represents uh, thousands and thousands of businesses in the downtown, have done a complete public 180 and now they're wholeheartedly in support of new bike lanes, of the bike share and, and new public spaces. So we're at a very uh, exciting time politically in Vancouver where, uh, you know, a, a quiet majority of the population is in favor of expanding the bike network and we're excited to see where it goes from here. Oh, you want to talk Yeah, about sorry. This is one of three fully protected intersections we now have in the city of Vancouver. This is part of my commute home every day. Uh, for context, this was not even paint. This was Sharrow's um, on this stretch. So um, I can say that this is way better than it used to be. <laughs> Actually, I think, Mark, you wrote you said you wrote on it like three times in, in a circle? 30 times. 30 times. <laughs> 
Um, so one of the big lessons that we try to emphasize wherever we get to give this presentation and what we hope we emphasize in the book is that our streets are not uh, locked. They're not, just because they've been one way for 50 years does not mean that we can't re-examine how we use our street space and use our city space. And the perfect example of that is the city of Rotterdam. Um, for those that aren't familiar, they were the unfortunate recipients of some very heavy bombing uh, in, during the Second World War due to a terrible miscommunication between the German forces and their bombers after the Dutch acquiesced and surrendered. Uh, so their entire city center was decimated, save that one cathedral that you can see there. And post-war, although it was a tragedy, planners and uh, city builders saw it as this huge opportunity. Now we can build our city in Robert Moses' ideal. We can build wide streets, make it a modernist dream, tall buildings, and you know, really achieve what no other Dutch city can achieve because they don't have the blank slate that we do. And so they set about in the 50s and 60s doing just that, widening streets, separating commerce from business, from living, and essentially creating almost a hollowed out city center as a result because everyone was leaving the city to go to their suburb suburban home at the end of the day. Uh, but then in 1973, um, well in the 70s, along with all of the other activism that was going on throughout the country, but also during the 1973 OPEC oil crisis, uh, suddenly, the residents of Rotterdam realized that their streets were, were not really a space for them anymore. We, they had handed over so much space to cars, that, and when cars were no longer a viable option due to economics, um, it, it no, no longer made sense. And so, through activism and through recognizing what their streets could be, they started to push back. So if, if you visit Rotterdam today, again, it's very, very different than, than you know, the modernist dream that was sold to them after the Second World War. Um, they managed to utilize the space that was provided to them to retrofit their streets to a more human scale. Um, they have these beautiful grass tramways that run down a lot of their arterial roads that um, run a, a fast, frequent light rail system. They have these wonderful wide cycle tracks where you can ride two, three, sometimes four abreast. Um, down the street uh, pretty comfortably and then there's obviously plenty of space for walking so they've um, used the the North American style street grid um, that was passed down to them by by the engineers and planners um, and made it a more multi multimodal city where one in four trips in the city are made by bicycle which again is pretty low by Dutch standards but uh, we would uh, we would love to have that uh, here in North America so when looking at you know, examples in North America where that retrofit is happening, it seemed almost perfect to go where Robert Moses sort of decided to, to change a city entirely here in North America, and that's New York City. Um, we had the absolute pleasure of getting to speak with Jeanette Sadek Khan and learning about everything that her and her team were able to do during the Bloomberg years to really start redistributing space for walking and cycling in public space. And you know, it's pretty amazing in a city that has a, a, a pretty notorious reputation as being car clogged and, and a place pretty hostile to people on bikes. We got to uh, travel through those streets during on Labor Day weekend. And the city that we got to experience was so different from the place that we visited. We were uh, 17, 18 years old ourselves, so 20 years ago, where we can remember jumbled up on the side of the street trying to get a picture with Times Square in the background. And then meanwhile, when we were there just earlier, at the beginning of September, we got to enjoy Times Square as it exists now, com a complete public space. Uh, lots of seating, lots of people just stopping and resting, and a lot of that was just achieved with nothing more than some paint, planters, and plastic chairs. So New York holds its, it can hold itself up as an example for cities like Seattle, cities like Vancouver even, where we can start redistributing our space a little bit better and change it into a place that is better for everyone. So the fourth uh, and final Dutch city that we'll talk about this evening is Eindhoven, and they are uh, kind of a mid-sized city, about 400,000 people, uh, but a lot further away from the, the urban centers of Amsterdam and Rotterdam and The Hague. Um, so they're quite isolated, and they have a really interesting industrial past. They were the home to the Philips Electronic Company uh, for almost 100 years, which was founded there during the First World War as a light bulb factory, um, and was the city's primary employer for, uh, again, almost until the mid-1990s. 
Um, like Rotterdam, it received some uh, damage during the Second World War, and again, the, the modernist planners came along and used that as an excuse to rip down anything that was remotely damaged, um, to create parking lots, to create wider streets, um, and, and space for, for driving in and out of the city, which was seen as uh, the way of the future. Um, the one kind of exception is, is that Eindhoven was kind of one of the first cities to build fully separated cycle paths, but um, it was not to accommodate for the cyclists, it was just to get them out of the way of the motorists because they were seen as, a, as an inconvenience, as slowing down the car, uh, which were the real contributors to society, um, and get the bikes out of the way, whether it was tunnels um, or, or bridges or, um, or off to the side. And so um, that kind of continued until uh, the Phillips company left town in, in the mid-1990s and then a number of other industrial uh, companies, manufacturers left town and the, the city kind of found itself in a pretty grave economic crisis and, and, uh, and didn't know what to do next. So rather than sit back and just let fate decide what would happen, the, the city of Rotterdam decided that it was time Eindhoven. to... Sorry, city of Eindhoven. I'm still two, three slides back. <laughs> the city of Eindhoven decided to uh, change course and make themselves a place of innovation and technology. And nowadays, it's actually a place um, where businesses are being fostered in places like Impact Hub, where they're providing incubators for uh, new tech companies, new artists. They've, they're transform they've transformed their old factory into one of those spaces where p uh, young people can come and start up new businesses. And they're, they're putting some heavy investment in into uh, a lot of tourism, and so part of that is, you know, using innovation and technology to build things like the Hoven Ring, which again is still keeping cyclists separated from motorists, but in a pretty beautiful way. Um, they've got the Starry Night Path, which is an homage not only to Philips uh, and their light bulbs, so they have LED lights that light up these uh, solar-powered stones, but also to Van Gogh, who lived in the nearby village of Noon. And they're even starting to retrofit some of those tunnels that were pretty stark by putting in fun, uh, whimsical paint jobs like uh, the Monty Python Silly Walk, which, which was one of our personal favorites. Um, and it's really a way to not only draw new talent, draw new industry and new money into the city, but also to draw tourism as the, second ho the home of the second largest airport in the country. They want people to fly in, stop, spend time, spend money before they move on to their next uh, location. And it's proving to be quite a worthwhile destination for a lot of people, uh, us included. So in, in searching for a North American parallel, um, again, we didn't have to look very far in, in the city of Calgary, Alberta, which is kind of in the middle of the, well, I should say middle of the Canadian prairies, but um, about a 12-hour drive east of Vancouver. Um, and there, you know, six or seven years ago, they kind of went through a similar uh, crisis. Uh, their economy is heavily dependent on the, the nearby oil sands. They have a lot of oil and gas companies there. Um, and with the, when the price of oil dropped very quickly, they suddenly found themselves with almost a 30% vacancy rate in the city center. Um, and so they found themselves having to attract new people and new businesses into the city center by building a, a city that was worth actually moving to and traveling to. Um, the first step on that was the Peace Bridge, which is uh, the beautiful uh, structure up in the top left corner. It was designed by Santiago Calatrava. The city's first piece of active transportation infrastructure it was a walking and cycling bridge across the Peace River, um, and also the first time that the city specifically mentioned beauty in the design brief. The, the prevailing attitude up to then was, well, we'll go to Paris for something that's beautiful, and we'll, in Calgary, we just need it to work. Um, but the, the, the Peace Bridge has become a, a place on the river where people gather, where people get their wedding photographs taken, um, and it's become kind of an icon for, for the city, and, and it's used in tourism brochures and the like. The Peace Bridge then brought new, more and more people on bikes into the city center, and, and so it kind of pointed to a latent demand and a, a lack of safe cycling space in the city center. And um, to address that, rather than build one single cycle track, um, the city council kind of boldly decided to build an entire network of cycle tracks overnight. Um, so they voted eight to seven um, to build a cycle track pilot project that was uh, six cycle tracks um, that would provide a basic minimum grid in the downtown core. Um, cut the ribbon on them very quickly and then they could adapt them, they could adjust them, they could measure them and, 
uh, and make sure people were using them. And then if they didn't work or if they affected traffic too badly or they created safety concerns, then we could rip them out, no harm, no foul, and, and the city would move on business as usual. But as you can imagine, after 18 months, um, people started using them. It induced uh, 1.2 million new bicycle trips uh, simply by reallocating 3% of the downtown road space. And so um, after those 18 months, the council actually overwhelmingly voted to keep it permanent. So there were a number of politicians that changed their vote after they saw uh, that a cycle track network uh, can work in their city. And, and this, again, is in a, a rather froze, frozen city. They just had their first dusting of snow. I should say dusting, dumping of snow yeah. a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and it's a pretty wintry city, but people, again, now are starting to cycle there year-round because they're provided this comfortable space to, to ride their bikes. So back to the Netherlands. Um, we've, I think, made, made the point that the Dutch have made cycling in their cities pretty comfortable, and, and cycling has become a default met method for those short-range trips up to three miles. Um, so they've started kind of looking further afield to the intercity trips, the longer-distance trips, and... Um, that this is through a, a network of Snellfiets routes, which are, are uh, fast cycling routes that they're starting to build between their cities. Um, and the first and most prominent one is the Rhinewall pad, um, which you can see on your screen there. We had the pleasure of riding it um, last summer, and uh, it's a 14-kilometer route between Nijmegen and Arnhem on the, on the eastern side of the Netherlands near the German border. And you can ride from one city center to the other without having to put your foot down once. So it's a pretty... Uh, fast, convenient, comfortable cycling route that's um, specifically designed to reduce congestion in the region. Um, they are connecting the commercial, the residential, the shopping hubs, um, and, and not coincidentally placing this cycling path right next to the motorway and the, and the train tracks so that they have a captive audience of people that are stuck in the train or in their cars and they can see that there's an alternative that's uh, lit quite spectacularly with these, with these lights in the, in the evening as well. Um, and that is creating new options for commuters um, in combination with the e-bike. And so um, electromobility is, is another area where the Dutch are really innovating and, and pushing the envelope. One in three new bicycles sold in the Netherlands now are e-bikes. They're uh, electric assist. Um, but the Dutch aren't using it to, you know, ride faster. They're using it to um, get older people to maintain their mobility. 80% uh, of those e-bikes are going to people 50 years of age or older. So um, the, the, um, the idea being that people that need a little bit of a, a push on their back um, will ride more frequently and they'll ride um, further distances with that, with that extra push. So the other thing that the Dutch are doing really, really well, and I heard uh, glimpses of it uh, in the introduction, is that they're finding ways to make cycling connect with transit and really feed their transit system. Uh, so it doesn't matter which rail, rail station you're at in the city, there are cycle tracks that feed into it. Um, providing the Dutch residents with an option to ride to a train station, hop on a train, and get to their destination very seamlessly. Um, by providing ample, safe storage, they're facilitating those trips even more because their trains are already at capacity, they can't possibly fit any more bikes, so they solve that problem of storage by providing great facilities at each of the stations. And then they're extending the viability of that transit by having the OV Feats, which is their national bike share scheme um, for three euro 50 per 24 hour period. Uh, any Dutch resident can grab a bike at their destination station and ride those uh, these lovely yellow and blue bikes anywhere they need to in the city, back to the station again, hop on the train, go home, pick their bike up in that massive sea of bikes, and go home, all in a, in a very green and connected option. Um, and the reason this is important, if you want to go to the next slide, babe, <laughs> is that you know most of us are willing to walk maybe one, two miles, um, but the bike expands that. So essentially by creating stations that are accessible by bike, they're expanding the catchment area for those rail stations by five times the distance. And so they're getting even more people fed into the system, feeding public transit, bringing money to the system. Um, but what's important, too, is that the Dutch don't use that as a reason to keep stations further apart. They still keep them close together, 
to provide options for residents. So it's not like you only have one station that is your home station. People have the option of choosing you know, two, three stations depending on what their final uh, destination is. And that is expanding that five times the number of people by five more. So 25 times the amount of people are able to access a lot of these stations and really build this interconnectivity when it comes to bikes and transit. Another area where they're really innovating in the Netherlands around bakfiets, uh, which are literally translates to box bikes. Um, and we're kind of familiar with cargo bikes here in North America for family use, for personal use, you know, getting a couple of kids uh, home from school or getting a couple bags of groceries home from the grocery store. But um, in a professional setting, in an uh, urban setting, um, the Dutch are, are starting to use cargo bikes in quite interesting and exciting ways. Um, Albert Hein, which is their, their nation's largest supermarket chain, has started using cargo bikes to make their deliveries. And so they've developed with Urban Arrow, which is an electric cargo bike manufacturer based in Amsterdam, um, a cargo bike that can carry 30 crates of groceries um, and allows their, their drivers to uh, avoid the traffic jams and, and, and not have to uh, drive around the block to, to search for that parking spot. In Utrecht, the Coca-Cola company, um, has started equipping their service technicians with cargo bikes. So rather than drive a big empty van with a couple of toolboxes around, they're now putting their tools in, in the electric cargo bike and uh, doing their service routes that way with the obvious impact to their health and, and well-being. Uh, and then the real kind of exciting uh, area that we've, we dig into in the book is around urban logistics, not just the, uh, the National Post System, which has started using cargo bikes for mail and packages, but the kind of the big heavy hitters in, in the logistics industry, FedEx, UPS, and DHL have started to use electric cargo bikes um, in, in pilot projects across the Netherlands. And um, DHL is, the, is the, um, the case study that we look at in the book. They've started using a containerized system. So it's a uh, uh, four or six containers that are dropped into the city center by van. And then these containers are thrown onto the back of a cargo bike, an electric cargo bike, and, uh, and then the the delivery driver makes the last mile delivery uh, in the city center by electric cargo bike. And DHL is estimating that these, these vehicles are half uh, the cost in terms of servicing and, and gasoline and maintenance and depreciation. Uh, but they're also able to make twice as many deliveries as they would in a traditional van. So it's, it's becoming a, a fast and inexpensive way for them to handle their deliveries. Uh, and then uh, they obviously have the added bonus of reducing their, their carbon emissions. So we've gone through a lot of the more qualitative reasons or, or research that we've come across in terms of why this investment has been so good for the Dutch. But we wanted to go through a bit more of the quantitative ones. And the first one would be in terms of safety. So by making these strategic investments, they are um, reducing the number of, pe number of collisions on their streets. Uh, so the death rate that we talk about in the book was about 3.4 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. Um, here in the US, that number is 10.7. So almost three times the number of people are dying on the streets here in the US as are in uh, the Netherlands because we are not providing the same safe space. And it's uh, it estimated that if we were to bring a lot of those investments over here, we could save an average about 22,000 lives simply by creating a safer space for people to move around their streets. But we like to stress that it's not just about preserving human life, it's also about extending it. And the idea that safe streets don't just keep people safe, but they also allow them to live uh, longer and healthier lives. Um, the, the amazing stat that we always point to is the fact that the Netherlands is the only country in the European Union that will reverse its obesity rate, um, which is predicted to be 8.5% uh, in the next uh, 10 years or so. And, and it's quite low compared to a lot of neighboring countries. Uh, in Ireland, for instance, the obesity rate will be almost 50%. So um, there's obvious economic impacts, and, and the, there's studies that uh, uh, estimate that the rate of cycling in the Netherlands saves their health care system 19 billion euros per year, which is uh, almost 3% of their gross domestic product. So it's not an unsubstantial amount of money. The other stat that we came across, which, which really hit home being parents ourselves, is that 
Um, because of these investments, they're actually creating spaces where parents are more willing to let their kids roam. And what that's equating to is just happier, healthier children. Uh, UNICEF does a study every year of the 29 wealthiest countries in the world and rates them on health, happiness, um, overall well-being, well-being of their families. And in 2013 and subsequent years, the Dutch came out on top as their children being the happiest and having, leading the, having the highest quality of life. And a lot of that is attributed to the fact that because the spaces are safer and parents are more comfortable with their children roaming, those kids are enjoying freedom independent, and independence a lot earlier than um, their counterparts in other, uh, other countries around the world. And you know that's something we've experienced with our own children, having grown up in a city that, yes, is making those investments, but not at a rate fast enough where you know, we've been living there for 11 years and our children are only just now at the ages of nine and 12 being able to enjoy, enjoy a little more of that freedom. Um, and even then it's in a very tight bubble because you know, we have a lot of those same concerns, a lot of parents around traffic and, and what that means in terms of our kids walking and cycling. So you know, I, we always see the huge potential of bringing those ideas over here to benefit not just us as adults, but for a lot of our children as well. So the last piece of the puzzle, and, and is perhaps the most compelling in terms of making the case for investing in cycling, is the fact that um, the Dutch have proven that, and this is kind of counterintuitive, that by building more space for cycling, they've kind of paradoxically created more space for driving. And uh, the, the, um, we like to point to the fact that uh, Waze, the, the navigation app, has ranked the Netherlands the most pleasant place to, in the world to drive a car for the last three years. Um, and so it kind of proves that by um, making the car the last resort, by allowing people to walk, cycle, and take public transit, that uh, that frees up precious road space for people who can drive, who have to drive, who really want to drive. Um, but for everybody else, it provides uh, transportation options, especially by combini combining bicycles and public transit. Um, and, and not the least of which is obviously the, um, the freight companies and the, and the emergency services, which don't have to sit in traffic behind single occupant vehicles. So now we kind of come full circle. And we're at a point, I think, in a lot of North American cities where we need to decide what kind of future it is that we want for our cities. Uh, left to their own devices, and we always get a little flack for this, and we might hear as well. Um, <laughs> uh, tech companies or people like Elon Musk might have us traveling in our own personal bubble. Um, and as much as I love that film, that is not the future I want for all of us. Um, I would love to live in a place where children could roam and, and ride quite safely. Uh, like they do in the, in the Netherlands, like my children got to. Um, and we still, we know we're doing a lot. And as we've, we hope we've communicated here, you know, it's not just something that's attainable in the Netherlands. There are a lot of North American cities that are getting there. We just keep, need to keep communicating why it's important to keep making these strategic investments, what it means beyond just a little bit of asphalt on the road in terms of what, it, what impact it can have on our society. And, you know, really think about where we go from here. So we'll, we'll wrap up tonight with a little bit of shameless self-promotion. The book is Building the Cycling City. It's been out since August 28th. We couldn't be prouder of it. If you, if you enjoyed uh, the topics that we touched on tonight, we really kind of do a deep dive in a lot of these subjects and a lot of these cities and, and topics. Um, but we, we certainly don't want you walking away tonight feeling hopeless, feeling like um, kind of as we did when we first got back to the Netherlands, that the job is too monumental, that there are decades and generations ahead of us. And, um, we've got so much work left to do that it, it almost seems impossible. But we like to point out that, you know, not only can we do what the Dutch are doing, we are, we've started, and we can learn from their mistakes and um, perhaps even move at an ex accelerated pace. Um, like Rome, the Dutch cycling utopia wasn't built in a day, and um, we just need to keep, keep pushing and keep on fighting. Um, and the, the quote we like to leave everyone with, which is kind of a, an adapted Chinese proverb, is that the best time to build a cycle track is 20 years ago but the second best time is now. So thank you for your attention and uh, Thanks, that was great. Thank you. I'd like to invite our panel up. We have a fantastic panel. Can we get another round of applause for Melissa and Chris? That was just really great. Hello. 
My name is Clara Cantor. I'm a community organizer for Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. And we just saw this fantastic presentation about all of the ways that Seattle can be a better place for cycling. Um, and now we're going to step into a discussion mode with a fantastic panel here. Um, sorry. Um, talking about how we can bring it here to Seattle, how we can make that dream that we just saw a reality. Um, we started putting together this panel um, and brought together a whole bunch of local experts in bicycling and in bicycling advocacy. And we realized that we had a panel of entirely women, so we decided to kick Chris off the panel and <laughs> swap him for Coralie, his daughter, um, who's going to be joining our panel as the voice for the future. So <laughs> um, I'm just doing a quick round. We have Melissa, who was our keynote speaker. We have Coralie, who is Chris and Melissa's daughter. Um, we have Bree Geinkild, who is the co-leader of Central Seattle Greenways and the woman responsible for um, getting Pike Pine protected bike lanes in place in the future. Um, we have Genesee. <laughs> We have Genesee Atkins, who's the Seattle Department of Transportation Chief of Staff. And we have Amanda Barnett, who is um, the immediate past co-chair of the Seattle Bike Advisory Board. <laughs> Welcome to your panel. Um, let's try and make a little curve here so we can make this more discussion oriented. How's that? Everyone cozy? So we can pretend you all aren't even there. <laughs> All right, so um, hopefully this can be just a relaxed conversation. We can pass the mics back and forth a little bit. Um, is there anything from that presentation that really stuck out in your head as something that you saw as important for Seattle? I'll go. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that I find really inspiring and important to remember is that um, these places that we idealize and we all look to and think, oh, it'd be fantastic to be there, weren't always like that. And that our city doesn't have to always be like it is right now. And this is exactly what they said during the presentation. But basically, what we have right now in terms of infrastructure and culture, we have, thanks to countless decisions by a number of people over the last century. And so we can change both our infrastructure and our culture through different decisions made by people over the next, hopefully it doesn't take a century, <laughs> but, um, but that, that it's not immutable, right? We can, we can change what we have. Someone else speak now. Um, I, I, yeah, I just want to echo what Bree said. I think the mutability of the right of way was incredibly powerful, and um, that history of the Netherlands, I actually didn't know, so this was really educational for me. Um, also, the need for a political will um, in being on the Seattle Bicycle Advisory Board. I work uh, with a board who comes from, you know, there's a lot of perspectives that people have, and we are all working to advise uh, SDOT, City Council, and the Mayor's Office, and um, you know, everyone at SDOT is just so on board. Um, There's so many great designers, so many great planners and policy makers, and um, they at the end of the day have to uh, basically answer to their boss, and that's the elected officials who we um, rely on to make our bigger decisions. And so. Unfortunately, we just saw with the Move Seattle Levy reset um, some big changes in Seattle and the way that we are going to allocate those funds. And I think that has a lot to do with the new mayor. And there's a lot of really, really great things that came out of that process, like um, some excellent clarity as to how we're going to pay for things. And um, it also allowed us to see that we kind of don't have enough money to pay for some of the things that we thought we'd be able to pay for um, by 2035. So making sure that you vote and that you vote in people that really uh, hold and share your values and will um, advocate even in the face of um, some, some very big um, no's and um, you know the people who don't want things to happen the way that things happened in the Netherlands. Um, I imagine that 
we are at that place right now in Seattle. It feels like we're on the precipice of a big change, but it really comes down to what our elected officials are gonna do next. Can I add another idea? I think one of the things from the presentation specifically that I that resonated with me and is it speaks a little bit, like you're saying, Amanda, to the precipice that we are, uh, where we're at right now, is about continuing to change what active transportation looks like. Uh, because I think you're, you're too, I, can't, I have no idea what those Dutch words were, but for your, <laughs> your, your uh, spandex clad cyclist, your- The wheel runner and the fietser? Yes, I, I, think, <laughs> I think there's a lot that um, we can accomplish as we help that take root that there's a spectrum, that there's a continuum for what walking and biking and all these other modes of transportation look like. I think as we demystify that and make it more, you know, again, more ingrained and more regular, a regular sort of, I mean, that's sort of it. We wanna make this regular, not an aberration, not a, you know, small minority. We want this to be something that really becomes a regular part of life in the city uh, and I think it's frankly something that Greenway does really, really, really well, is trying to put a real variety of faces on what that looks like. I think that helps build the political will. I, help, I think that helps uh, our elected officials understand what it means and feels uh, to regular people. I just wanna add to that too. I mean, like what you said, it's, it's really important to show that like a lot of people, a lot of different faces and uh, one of the things that we really try to emphasize is that diversity in the imagery that we present in terms of cycling is really important. Um, you know, there's that old adage, you know, you have to see it to think that you can be it. And, you know, a lot of times, and we had the same uh, challenges in Vancouver, a lot of our photography from you know, the imagery coming out of the advocacy community and even from the city of Vancouver was very, for lack of a better expression, pale, stale, and male. <laughs> and it's part of the reason that I started writing because, and, and like showing what it was like for me was because I wasn't seeing anybody like me represented and you know, I'm a middle income, uh, average white family and you know, for me, if I was being misrepresented or not represented, imagine what that meant for community minorities, uh, people of color, people living in lower incomes and so I think, yeah, taking taking a cue from that and really showing the diversity of people that can be, be can be helped through proper investment in active transportation and providing mobility options is, is a huge step forward. One more thing that I would add to that, it, it really gets me every time walking, biking, and using transit is referred to as alternative transportation. Um, it's transportation, right? So I challenge everyone to like push back on that. So that's actually a really nice segue. Um, the <laughs> um, there was a very recent uh, article that came out with the most recent census data in Seattle, um, and there were definitely some problems with the data as it was collected. Um, but it's I think we can all agree that it basically said that Seattle is not achieving its mode share goals, and it's not achieving an increase in ridership that it wants. Um, particularly for women, um, but for everyone. Um, I was wondering if you guys could comment on that phenomenon in Seattle, why we're not achieving our goals, what we can do better. So it's a I big question. <laughs> well, do you mean specific to bicycling? Um, yes. Okay. But it could be broader if you wanted to take it. Well, so I, I, I guess the thing is, and this is tying it back to bicycling, we, we are a tremendous mode shift city. And I think we have like actually really amazing mode shift mojo. We over the last eight years have brought our single occupant vehicle trips downtown down by 10% to an all-time low. It's huge, it's great. While, while we brought in way more jobs, it's awesome. Um, and it's not a, any one person who gets the credit for it. Most of the trips, about half of those trips downtown are on transit, but another 20, 25% are biking, walking, carpools. And just over the last couple of years, 
the, our SOV um, percentage went down 5% and only 1% increase in transit, which means that more people started walking, more people started taking bikes. I think we have a lot of potential. I think there's a lot of potential for us to take what we do well around mode split and just like take it off into the sunset. I think we actually have a lot of potential. Um, uh, I took the, the question around the uh, ACS uh, <laughs> survey info back to our fantastic smart people at work. And they were like, oh, well, we would quibble with a lot of that data because it's just one year and na, 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 na. Um, the things that we're seeing, uh, it's worth saying, kind of, there's an issue of gender, but what we see is largely universal in terms of barriers. I mean, we hear a lot, uh, and this is what a lot of people hear, for the what we call willing but uh, wary, we see a lot of people who are worried about weather uh, and you know dark summer, uh, winter months, uh, and hills. We hear a lot about that, and I think that's part of why we're excited about what's happening in the city around bike share and around e-bikes. It's all very exciting. So I think um, those are real barriers and obstacles for people who are not hardcore, dedicated riders, uh, and it's going to take a lot, including safe infrastructure for all ages and abilities, for us to be able to really make continued uh, strides in that area. Um, a few things. So I think uh, the on the piece about the gender disparity, I think that for me as a woman, I have a rule when I'm on my bike, actually when I'm walking also, and it's if somebody can't hear me scream, I don't feel comfortable in that place. And unfortunately, it's like sad, but true. And unfortunately, that is a lot of places in Seattle. There are a lot of, especially bikeways, where um, I would feel really uh, isolated for long periods of time. And so I think that moving forward, um, it's a little bit on the design community to think really about that sort of safety and um, who we're designing for. And, and I'm just, that's one sort of type of person, um, but really there are so many other types of people that we should be thinking about when we're thinking about safe streets. I mean, we design for um, uh, our most vulnerable users and um, all, um, what's the phrase? All ages and abilities. Sorry, I'm blanking. And, um, but, but there's actually a lot more that we need to think about. We do need to think about low-income communities, communities of color, um, non-native English speakers, and um, we need to make sure that not only are they, are they put as priorities when we're thinking about what we want to do with our streets, um, but we really also need to make sure that they're part of the process the whole way. So, um, you know, not, it's not just white-led organizations who are doing the planning and the designing and getting the design awards and all that. It, it ha we have to broaden our reach and try to bring people into the fold who haven't historically been part of that conversation. And um, in this uh, presentation, it was so fabulous, I just wish there was one myth that was busted, and I wish that that was the myth uh, well, actually, maybe it wasn't even, I, I don't know if it's busted or not, but um, just about how the Netherlands is dealing with their uh, refugee population and how they're bringing that into the right of way. And because that is something that we don't really often talk about as a bicycle community in Seattle. How are we dealing with our communities experiencing homelessness who have every legitimate right to the right of way? And um, oftentimes I hear many people referred to as blocking the road, blocking the cycle track, but um, I, truthfully, I don't know that any one person has more or less of a right to be there than another. Well, I, can, I can speak to that a bit. Um, so there, there is a, a myth even in the Netherlands that uh, newcomers don't cycle as often. Uh, they, they just don't ride bikes. And what we found and what we talk about in one of the chapters is that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, there are a lot of community organizations that are bringing cycling to those communities because they're asking for it. 
uh, they they understand that to live in the Netherlands, you ride a bike, and uh, they're coming oftentimes from countries where they either haven't had access to that, they don't have safe spaces, or they weren't allowed to, especially when we're talking about women from some communities. And so they've approached community organizations, community centers, and asked for these lessons, and they are be pr being provided with those. Um, one of the women that we got to interview who works um, for MobiCon in the Netherlands, her name is Angela Vanderkliff, has been doing a lot for the last 10, 15 years in terms of that and in terms of providing those education classes. And one of the neat things that she found is that often these groups started out small. It'd be like maybe five, 10 women that would show up, uh, try riding a bike, but then they would go home and tell their friends and their friends would come and those groups would start, like grow and grow and become more than just a cycling class and become an opportunity for community building for them. Um, and even finding that they were then getting their children to ride and then getting their husbands or partners to ride. And so um, it's, you know, it's really dispelling that idea that just because they don't look like the average native Dutch person doesn't mean they're not riding a bike. And we got to see a lot of that in uh, more refugee communities of uh, women in full hijab riding bikes. So um, it's not as prevalent, obviously. It's all dependent on funding that's often run by nonprofits, but it is something that they are trying to address. Back to your original question as well. Um, I used to hear people say they didn't bike because of the weather or the hills. Like 20 years ago, I heard that a lot. I don't know the last time I heard that. When I hear people saying they're not biking, it's totally safety. They don't feel safe. And I, I don't know enough about how those statistics were gathered and how, how accurate they are. Um, but I will say that uh, I feel much less safe on the streets than I did 10 years ago because drivers are more aggressive. Drivers are frustrated, honestly. I don't, when we say aggressive, it sounds like they're intentionally mean. And I don't think they are. I think it's, it's frustrating and what we see is people who are just looking for their opening to be able to make that left turn and then they're not also checking to make sure they're not taking out someone vulnerable when they make that left turn, right? Um, so, so that to me is I think a big piece of it and also the construction that has just made a lot of our streets really chaotic. Um, so, you know, look forward to the next recession for that to clear up a little bit. Um, but I also, I do wonder a little bit, and this may be kind of controversial, but we are pushing constantly for safer streets, which is important. And in that push, we highlight how dangerous it is. And I think for people who aren't already biking regularly, but who want to, they keep hearing us tell them how dangerous it is. And I, I do have to wonder if there isn't a way that we need to make sure that while we're talking about how dangerous it is, we also talk about what a joy it is and how convenient it is and how much faster it can be than other modes and less expensive and better for the planet and all these kinds of things and not always just talk about how dangerous it is. So, I don't know. I'm gonna ask Coralie if she has anything to add. <laughs> well, okay, so. <laughs> My question to you is, what do you think that people could do, cities could do, to get you and your friends to ride more often? I mean, um, definitely making the streets safer, but like having people have younger children giving opinions and giving how they feel about what's going on. And yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Do you find your trip I have a different opinion on different areas. At the beginning, we have a really unsafe street where it's just a crosswalk and cars are rushing to lights and work. And then there are a whole bunch of people, kids in my neighborhood who all find it really unsafe to cross and then there's a whole only bikes and pedestrian path all the way to school for me and um, which I find really great because um, I don't know <laughs> I'm going blank um, Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I find 
disappointing. As a kid, I walked and biked to school, right? And I think a lot of us did. And I know that um, we're working in Seattle to try to bring safe routes to school and make that more possible for more people. But we still see a lot of communities where either the school is situated in an unsafe place or um, there, are, there are all kinds of wacky things that happen around our schools that make it hard for people to walk and bike there. What's it like in Vancouver? Do most of your friends walk or bike to school? Or what does that look like? Well, for our school, it's usually neighborhoods, so a lot of people walk together to school. There are like big clumps of friends, and then they all meet up at school and hang out before the bell rings and school starts because it's just basically usually our school is just people in the neighborhood and Usually they walk or bike. Kids in French immersion ride too. Okay. Kids in French immersion ride too. And walk. <laughs> um, We're busting a myth up here. <laughs> um, and then there are some kids who have to be driven because of not having safe routes or living too far away to ride and not being trusted, not having parents trust drivers to look around and watch and be safe around the kids who are riding and walking. So, so it's not perfect. No, it's not perfect. <laughs> but there's, there's always something to improve on. So, yeah. So, I have a question for you also. Do you have any, given that you would like to hear more young voices in decision making, do you have any advice for the adults in the room? Um, well, if they, if they have kids and the, they're willing to talk about it with their kids, just ask for their opinion, ask what they think about what's going on and what they think about the bike routes and the change in infrastructure and everything when it comes to the change in better transportation like buses and transit and then better places to ride whether it's for fun or it's to a specific place so <laughs> Thank you, that's great. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. Does anyone have any closing things they just have to say to the crowd before we, de before we depart tonight? Do it, Bree. All right, right you know I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually want to leave us on a high note because the work we do in the advocacy field is, is challenging and frustrating and it can feel really slow. And I know that our friends in government can feel that way too. Like we, you know, three steps forward and two steps back sometimes and sometimes it, it feels like there's a lot of tension and struggle. But what I am trying to remember more and more is that even when we don't make all the progress that we're trying to make um, in terms of a specific piece of infrastructure, or even when we see conflict around some of these issues, um, we're advancing the movement, we're, we're getting closer to the change we want through every conversation we have. Every time somebody votes in your voice, your choice, and starts to think for the first time that maybe we can make the streets better and make the streets what we want them to be instead of whatever the status quo is, Every time a family biker goes down the street and somebody says, oh, I didn't know you could do that, right? Every, all of these things grow it, and, and we're all, we all have a part to play in continuing to talk about and model the, the way we want to live. So even, even when we feel like we're not making progress, and let's be clear, we are making progress, but even when, it, when things feel daunting, um, it's the community we're building and the conversations we're having that are that are really advancing us. So that's my go team. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> building on that, I think um, 
you know, it's really important to find the unlikely partners. Um, a lot of times in the cycling world, we often forget that we have fellow advocates in walking, in public transportation, and in city building. And teaming up, we can be a really powerful voice. Um, so yeah, keep finding those wins and keep building those coalitions, and that will keep your progress going. So in summary, ride your bike and make friends. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. All right. Thank you so much to all of you. That was a really wonderful conversation to close out the evening. Um, oh, okay. Round of applause for the panel. <laughs>Thank you all for coming. That uh, was a really great panel. Thanks, Clara, for hosting and everyone else. Um, if you're inspired to make some of that change happen and to make those new friends, come over, check out our booth over here. Get plugged in to all the things that are going on. Check out the other booths as well. There's a lot of food and drink in the back left, so please help yourselves. Um, you know, now is also a great time to support the Safe Streets effort, we have a two to one match for Seattle Neighborhood Greenways right now. So your $100 gift gets matched and becomes a $300 gift and really helps power this people powered movement. So please consider that. We have uh, donation envelopes over there. And be sure to check out and find a book of Building the Cycling City. Take a copy home. You won't regret taking home some inspiration. And last, let's just hear it again for our speakers, panelists, and sponsors. Thank you so much. And I need to just thank, again by name, uh, Susan, Clara, Mark, and Bridget, who just poured hours upon hours into making this event a success. So thanks to all of them. Thank you all. Have a good night, and have a good ride. <laughs>